Hello my friends, time for another story. Now I would like to emphasize once more that this is a story, not an experience. This is fiction, but it's got a theocratic kind of base to it. It's a story about how somebody might have got the truth, but it's not an experience. Cornwall used to be, that's the most westerly county in England. It used to be a tin mining area copper too and there's an interest still in mining and the mining industry down there and that's where this story starts it's called mine and yours Kate and I have an interest in the area I lived down there for a while the year before I met Kate back in the uh, back in 1969 and Kate and I have had vacations there quite often over the years we love it it's the part of England that seems most like Ireland to us in many ways. So here it is, mine and yours. It was interesting in the mine. Cornwall had such a history of tin mining particularly and no doubt until recent years where that wherever there was a mine all over the world there were men from the most westerly county of England who had worked in it. Barry had read about it and here he was now in a party of a dozen people underground in the Penwithin mine, no longer worked but open to the public. He didn't know any of the people who were in the party but they had arrived at about the same time, about the same time so they had been guided down into the gloomy passages and now he had some idea how tough life had been for the miners and for their families. So now the guide explained, there is only access to the next level down for able-bodied people and not for children. He looked at Barry and a young lady with long red hair and a bright red jacket with blue jeans. That seems to be just you two then. Barry looked about him and the party of five elderly people who were together and they nodded. They were not really able bodied. The other five people were a young mother with three children under eight and her mother. So the only fit adults were Barry and this pretty young lady. They looked at each other awkwardly. I do not go down any further with you, the guide explained with a smile. You just go down those stairs and you follow the signs. Madeline was not sure if she wanted to go into the dark and lonely place with a young man she had never seen before. But his shy and kindly smile made her feel more comfortable somehow. I'll go first, he said, in case there are hidden dangers in the mine. They both laughed, but she with nerves laughed more, far more than his comment really required. I am Barry Stanton, he said, holding out his hand. She accepted it and shook it with a gentle firmness that surprised him. Hi, Barry. I'm Madeline McCauley. A of Ireland accent played with his ears like music of the night, and he gazed into her pretty green eyes that twinkled in the poor light. They did not notice that all the others had left, but in that moment a connection was made that needed few words to express themselves. Madeline started to giggle and she said, well, Barry, are we going mining or what? He joined her in laughter again and they descended together into the deep abyss below. The models of miners were so real and it was kind of uncanny down below. There was a light switch and a sign telling you that if you turned it off, it would come back on in a few seconds and it would show you what real darkness is like. He looked at her and she nodded and he threw the switch and for several seconds they were in the dark as neither of them had ever experienced before. A darkness so strong you could almost feel it. Truly down there nothing could be seen. They didn't speak or move until the light was restored. They read about how each miner got one candle issued a day and sometimes two would share one so that they could keep a candle for home. They took it in turns to read out the information and Madeline enjoyed his South of London accent as much as he did her North of Ireland one. Also she was thinking to herself, why do I feel so comfortable down here in the gloominess with this stranger? Will we go upstairs into the light and never speak to each other again? Well soon they did go up and as they left the mine she asked him which was his car. I don't have one he said. So how did you get here then? She asked out of concern and it showed in her voice. I walked but I can get a bus up the road I'm sure. Do you see that ancient Volkswagen Golf over there, the green one? He nodded. Well that's mine and if you trust my driving I'd be happy to give you a lift. Where are you going? 
Penzance, he said, but I don't wish to give you any trouble. No, that's fine, because I live in Newlyn, and I have to go through Penzance to get there. Are you in a hurry, he asked, almost afraid to hope. No, I can please myself, really. Can I buy you a coffee and a cake, then? His little boy pleading face made her smile. That would be very nice, thanks. They drove on to the first village they came to and they stopped outside a coffee shop and on entering both decided on a scone with some jam and cream to go with a drink. Soon conversation was flowing back and forth. Madeline was from Coleraine and he was from Clapham. She'd finished her arts course at university two years before and was now a freelance painter enjoying Cornwall. He was working on a holiday camp in Hale, but he was also writing a novel. He hadn't gone to university and she said, So what? They lingered over the coffee and he ordered them a second cup which she wanted to pay for, but he said, Not this time. After giggling again, she said, So is there to be a next time? And she said it, as she said it, she looked in deep into his eyes and said, Because I hope so. That was really our character. So do I, he said, and they arranged to meet up for a drink and maybe some music two days later, which was Saturday night. As they drove on to Penzance, she asked him what had most impressed him at the mine, and he said something that she would always remember about him. It was a fact that when just John Wesley went to preach in Cornwall, and the mine owners responded to the Bible, re responded to the Bible conditions improved for the workers. They cared more about their workers after that. Aye, Barry, she said. I noticed that too. Are you a religious man then? I wouldn't describe myself as religious at all, but I do have a spiritual side to me. Whilst I never go to a church, I do like the Bible. What about you? Me? Well, I guess I'm like that too. Ireland is a very religious country, but they're always fighting about it. I'm not convinced that any of the churches are really helping the world much of you, but the Bible has something about it and I read it sometimes. They didn't say it, but each was thinking that they were so alike it was almost uncanny. He read the Bible some too, but had long ago stopped any association with the church. She dropped him outside the library where he was going to collect a book he'd asked for them to get for him. He was researching some facts about how for a story he was writing. Each of them found the waiting for Saturday night to be almost painful. They found a pub where the music was a live band playing blues and gentle rock. They drank a little and they danced a lot. And as he walked to home they stopped on the bridge at Newlyn and for the first time he kissed her very gently. She responded by putting her head on his shoulder. When they got to her door, she said, How will you get home? He explained that he was staying in Penzance at her friend's for the night. She explained that while she was a very modern girl, she wouldn't invite him in. She had a kind of standard about that. And he said that was good. And he wasn't wanting her to do anything that was not comfortable for her. And then he added, I've never told a girl this before, Maddie. But I know I have already fallen in love with you. He could hardly believe he'd had the courage to tell her that so quickly. She put her arms around his neck and kissed him gently and whispered in his ear, The feeling is mutual, dear Barry. I'm sure that what I feel for you is love. The summer was soon over, over and Barry should have been returning to London, but instead he found a small apartment and worked as a waiter in a hotel so that he could stay near her. Madeline painted and some of her pictures sold and two, the two of them grew closer and closer. Love between them was so strong that they knew they would want to spend their lives together no matter what. They were two searchers together looking for answers to life's big questions. Where do we come from? Why are we here? They did attend a few religious services at various churches but nothing seemed to satisfy them and any question they asked the clergymen were treated as a nuisance a lack of faith, or they were palmed off with some condescending remarks like God works in a mysterious way, or you just have to have a simple faith. 
Maddy continued painting and was building a good reputation for her interesting interpretations of local scenes and buildings. Bright colours and chunky shapes and yet always quickly recognisable as St Ives Harbour or Penzance Town Hall or wherever she gave her special treatment to. One of the local art dealers would take, was taking her paintings and selling them often. He told her that her Irish charm came out in her work and he was a very fair man in advising her about her prices. Barry had submitted a novel to a London publisher and been rejected, but a publisher nearer in Truro, Cornwall, told him that the story he had written set in hail between the wars was intense, gripping, and certainly of interest to him with a view to publishing, and he asked him could he try and write another similar one. As he worked as a waiter, he studied the people and he soon found characters for his second novel. Yet when the two of them talked about life, they both sought the same answers. Why was there so much war and hatred in the world? Why were people being left to starve? Was there hope of a better world? If there was a God who taught the truth about him, which church, which people understood what was true? If they could only know the answer to these questions, life would be perfect. Almost. Winter turned to spring and one Sunday evening in the bright sunshine they were walking around the harbour area in the fishing village of Malzor. She had been explaining why boats are quite challenging to paint correctly and he just loved how animated she became when she was talking about art. Two young girls approached them. They were smartly dressed and friendly and of one of them offered them a couple of magazines to read and they took them more out of decency than because they thought they wanted them. They were both busy and the magazine sat in a small bedsit apartment above the studio she worked in. One day not long afterwards she, she had finished one day not long afterwards she had finished a beautiful painting of the sun setting off Land's End, and she went upstairs to make a midday snack. The magazines caught her eye as she put the junk mail on the table. She picked them up and took them down into the studio with her cheese and tomato sandwich and a coffee. Turning the pages of the Watchtower magazine, her eyes fell on a passage from the Bible book of Proverbs, a book that had always, fa always fascinated her. My son, if you accept my sayings and treasure up my commandments by making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to discernment, Moreover, if you call out for understanding and raise your voice for discernment, if you keep seeking for it as for silver and you keep searching for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of Jehovah and you will find the knowledge of God. It was from Proverbs chapter 2 and verses 1 to 5. She stopped to think about that. She liked the idea expressed in this passage, not a matter of just having a simple faith but digging for it as if for treasure. She didn't imagine the Bible writer was referring to digging up some treasure hidden by pirates like the Robbie Lewis, Louis Stevenson story Treasure Island, but rather as if for silver and her head went back to the mine that she was in where she and Barry had met just a, a few weeks before. So much effort and work to find tin or even copper down there, silver would be so, so much the same. So was this what you had to do to find the truth? Dig for it here in this book, the Bible? She was deep in thought about it when Barry came through the door. Having the day off but working in the evening, he decided to come and see her in the studio in, in the daytime. Wow, Maddie, that is beautiful. He expressed admiration for all of her work, but his sunset was in his view the best she'd ever done since he knew her. The unusual unnaturally bright colours of the rocks and sea, yet capturing perfectly the emotions a sensitive person feels standing at land's end as the sun dipped into the sea, bathed in everything in red celestial paint, really moved him. But Maddie, though pleased to see him, and to hear the huge vote of confidence about her work, had found something she thought was more important. Hang on a minute, Barry, I want to fetch something. She went to get a new English Bible that she had from childhood. She came back through the door with the right page open. Look, Barry, isn't this interesting? Barry scanned the page and stopped where her finger pointed. Read verse 1 to 5. 
His eyes stopped to reread verse 4. If you seek her out like silver and dig for her like buried treasure. Hmm. Interesting, Maddie. So it's saying we have to work to get knowledge of things. It doesn't just fall into our lap. It's a bit like mining, really. Exactly, she said. So we can forget all that just stuff, a simple faith stuff. We have to dig into this book. I want to, Maddie. I really do. But where do we start? I mean, if I want to know why we're here, where do we begin? Well, my granddad always said that the logical place to start anything was the beginning. Yeah, but you didn't find this at the beginning, did you? It's in the middle of the book. Why? Do you remember those magazines? She pointed at them by a coffee cup. I started reading them, and this kind of leapt out of the page at me. Do you know who produces those magazines, Maddie? Yes. Mama used to take them from a couple back home in cold rain sometimes. They're produced by Jehovah's Witnesses. Really? There are people I know little, very little about. Well, I don't know much. Mum used to bring them in sometimes, but I was usually at school. I know they don't go to war. Well, that has to be a plus for them then. The clergy used to preach against them at times. I kind of remember that in church. <laughs> that would be another plus then. They both laughed. Barry stayed with her for the afternoon and then something amazing happened. An elderly lady entered the studio rather smartly dressed and with a huge smile. Her accent marked her as Cornish, and she said she was making brief calls at the business premises today. I've been raising a question that many wonder about. She looked intently into the young couple's faces. In among all the religious confusion and wars, do you think there could be a religion that teaches people the truth? I sure hope so, Barry laughed, because we've just got ourselves convinced that we have to start searching for it as if it were silver, digging for it. The elderly lady stopped in her tracks. She paused to offer a little prayer for help, but they didn't know that. You mean like it says in Proverbs chapter 2? She asked. They were both impressed that she knew exactly where that scripture was. Yes, Maddie said. We were just reading that, but it's confusing. So many religions, so many conflicting ideas, and so much myth and mystery. True, me dear, the elderly lady now noticed the magazine but said nothing about them. All that confusion hides the truth, but it's still there. I see you've got a Bible. Let me show you a very important part of that truth. It's in that same passage. She read from the New English Bible that Maddie had on her table. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and attain to the knowledge of God. Now let me read you that from the translation I use most of the time. Then you will understand the fear of Jehovah and you will find the knowledge of God. Do you notice anything different in the two readings? Yes, I do. Barry had picked it up and so had Maddie. She was shaking. She was nodding her head. Yours says Jehovah, but Maddie's Bible says Lord. Yes, you're right. But look how Lord is written. L-O-R-D in capital letters. Would you like to know why? Maddie and Barry listened and learned about the way the divine name had been all but removed from the Bible by people who did not have any good reason for doing so. Do you think it matters? The elderly lady of faith asked. I guess it would, Maddie said. Barry was nodding in agreement. Well, it's like this, the lady said. I don't know who painted this beautiful picture. She pointed at the painting, but I'd like to because it is so beautiful. Thank you. It was me, Maddie said it modestly. I've only just completed it and have one job left before I get it framed. I have to sign it. The lady nodded. You're a fine artist indeed. But tell me, how would you feel if it went on exhibition somewhere and they took your name off and put the word artist in the corner instead? Barry laughed. <laughs> She'd be furious. She would, and rightly so. But who makes the real sunsets? God said Maddie. He's the greatest artist. Well said my dear but imagine he produced this book so that we could know who he is and connect him to the creation but they took his name out. So you didn't know to say that the maker of sunsets and all the other things is Jehovah the true God. Maddie and Barry felt they'd learned something of worth though they had to do some checking themselves. They gave elderly Grace Tremwell a cup of tea and some of Maddie's chocolate cake and when she left they were already firm friends. 
A year and a month later, they were both baptised as Jehovah's Witnesses, and very close to their wedding day, they'd arrived round at Gracie's home in Marazion, and they had a gift for her. Yes, it was the painting. Maddie had refused to sell it. They said, as she had used it to teach them such a valuable lesson, it rightly belonged to her. She was thrilled and shed tears of joy, but she also said that the greatest gift that all three of them had was knowing Jehovah, the only true God. As Barry and Maddie mined together, digging more and more into the word of God, life became ever more special. And as they shared their faith with others, they found the joy that can only be known by those who far from having a simple faith, have had all their questions answered and know why we're here, why this suffering, and what Jehovah, the true God, will soon be doing about it. True, for them, their life together had started in a deep, dark, black tin mine, but now it was just getting brighter and brighter. Whenever they passed the entrance to the pen within mine, they always made the same joke. That place is mine and yours. But inside they had the deep contentment that they had indeed mined and found something that was more worth more than either silver or gold. Hope you enjoyed that. As I said, my friends, it's just a story. It is not fact, but it's just a story. And what it does highlight is the great value of knowing Jehovah's name, knowing the truth and understanding why we're here, why the world's in the state that it's in and what the future holds. I'm glad you know that. I'm glad I know that. And I, like you, want to do all I can to share it with others. Hope you're all well. Kate joins me in sending love to every one of you. Thanks for listening to the story. Lots of love. Bye for now. Bye bye.